never will run dry. It's an open heaven you're releasing, and we will never be denied. Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells. We're stirring up deep, deep waters. We're gonna dance in the river. Dance in the river. Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells. We're stirring up deep, deep waters. We're gonna jump in the river. Jump in the river. Deep cries out. Deep cries out to you, deep cries out, deep cries out to you, we cry out, we cry out to you, Jesus. Y'all sing with me, here we go. I've got a river of living water, a fountain that never will run dry. It's an open heaven you're releasing And we will never be denied Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells We're stirring up deep, deep waters We're gonna dance in the river Dance in the river Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells we're stirring up deep, deep waters. We're gonna jump in the river. Jump in the river. Deep cries out, deep cries out to you. Deep cries out, deep cries out to you. We cry out, we cry out to you, Jesus. event going on today that we're pretty excited about. So Jimmy, to 
Today we get to celebrate with a family the baptism of a precious little boy. So I want to invite uh, Brianna and Carl to come on up. Thank you. All right. Tanley's being a little shy today. Yeah, okay. That's all right. That's all right. Oh, baptism is such an important part of the life of a in the life of a, a family, the life of a church. And today, and David, there's no way you can sneak anywhere, man. There's <laughs> zero way you can do that. Yeah, good shot, but it ain't happening. So, all right. Uh, <clears throat> so today, uh, our, we're going to baptize this little man. And the purpose behind baptizing a baby is it's a dedication. We're dedicating, their, this family is dedicating this precious little baby to the Lord. Uh, and so it's very important and very significant part in the life of a, of a family and life of a child. <clears throat> Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of His righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So, Carl and Brianna. Do you, in, the, uh, in presenting this child for holy baptism, confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before this child a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care that he be brought up in the Christian faith, that he be taught the holy scriptures, and that he learn to give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God? Will you do that? Will you endeavor to keep this child under the ministry and guidance of the church until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church? Will you do that? All right. Don't let me have you, little man. Oh, hi there. They're not far, I promise. They're right there. Yeah. All right. So far, so good. Okay. <laughs> what name is given this child? Carl Randall Ward III. Oh, that was cool. He hugged me a little bit. <laughs> All right. Carl Randall Ward III, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to see how far, how much I can get away with on today, okay? You know, little man, you're looking all around. I know you're seeing the worship team back there and all those folks <laughs> out there. Yeah, all these folks out here. You know, you and I, we get to play a part in little Carl's life. We get to come alongside Carl and Brianna, and we get to help teach him about Jesus by being a part of his life through uh, maybe being his, uh, working with him in vacation Bible school or being a part of uh, taking care of him in the nursery or, or being a part of Woodbine Kids. Yeah, they're right over there. Yeah, they have left. Yeah, yeah. And so you and I, we play a part in helping him know Jesus. We get to come alongside them and teach, them, teach him and love them and help them as they're walking this journey until he grows up. So... You have a vow. Will you, church, will you promise to come alongside and do everything you can within your power to help Carl come to know Jesus and to teach him about the love of Jesus? If you'll do that, will you say yes? yes. All right. All right. Well, look out there. You see all those folks? Yeah. They're the ones who are going to help teach you. Yeah. Yeah. I could do this forever. All right. Well, I want us to pray. Okay? Let's pray over the little men. Father, I thank you so much that we've had this wonderful opportunity to be together, to share in this time of baptism. Well, I thank you for 
little Carl and for Tinley both, Lord, that you have placed them in uh, Carl and Brianna's life and you have given them the opportunity to teach them to know and love Jesus. And I thank you that they're in a church that loves children and we get a chance to teach uh, him too and to come alongside them and encourage them and support them as they are teaching him to know and love Jesus. So, Father, we give you thanks for this day. And we thank you for these precious children. Especially thank you for this time when we can baptize Carl. Amen. That's right. <laughs> for it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs> he may be a preacher. You know, you can't ever tell. Yeah. So, mwah. so all right. Let's celebrate one more time with little Carl here. There you go. Great job. Oh, what a joy it is. Uh, I want to invite you at this time to please stand as we continue in the service. Please stand as you're able. Thank you all so much. God bless you. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears is like holy water on my skin. Dead men walking, slave to sin. I wanna know about being born again. I need you. Oh God, I need you. So take me to the riverside, take me under, baptize, I need you, oh God, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, it's like the sound of the symphony to my ears, it's like abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need Every day is the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. And I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water, your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water. Like holy water 
can't go back to the beginning. I can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promised you'd be. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet with me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet with me again? As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness your glory
Don't you love a baby baptism to start your Sunday morning? Isn't that the best? I just love it. Those are the best days. We were, Laura and I were over there talking about, first of all, we just loved how he just kept looking at us. He was adorable. But that's just, a, that is such a wonderful symbolic way because when we come to the Lord, we're, we're like babies, right? And he loves us and he nurtures us with his word. And we get to come alongside all these people and grow together. But it's just, it's just a, what an awesome way to start the day. We're excited to have all of you guys here today. Welcome to those of you visiting with us here today for the first time. And those of you that are joining us online, we're excited to have you as well. Um, if I can right now, I want to turn your attention to the screen. We're going to check out this week's announcements. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Dang it. Oh, hey. So, how are y'all doing today? Well, I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Let's get into those announcements. So, first announcement. Our church work day is now on the 19th, this Saturday. <laughs> what did you say? Our church work day is this, this Saturday, the 19th. I'll put subtitles in there. Church work day. Yeah, so we're gonna do some beautification of the campus. Uh, this coming up Saturday. Scary week, boy. So make sure you come out this Saturday at 8 a.m. Be there, be square. Also, Scott Homestead. He's coming here on June 9th and 10th. Yes, uh, the Friday. There's a family day for the entire community, so make sure you come out to that, you children, whippersnappers. Stay off my arm. Yeah, and so like Saturday, there's a class that Scott Humpson is gonna teach. So, there's only 40 spots available, and your kids could learn how to do magic. So email Miss Ann at ant at woodbinechurch.org to reserve your spot today. So that's all we have for you today. Make sure you get connected with us on our social medias like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and the website. Thanks, Second Head. I agree. And as always, I... And me. We'll see you later. That was my line. Hey, we'll see you later. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm just gonna go on. Uh, I wanna share with you a real quick announcement about our internet. Our, we, we've been having a lot of trouble, especially with all the work that's going on. So our internet is, has been down, uh, it's down again today. Uh, so uh, it, the, I, we usually have a copy of the notes for you that are, are available through our QR code. Um, if you need a copy of the notes, just let me know. I'll get you a copy, okay? Because they're not going to be available today, and I apologize the sermon notes on that. So, But with this QR code, you can let us know how, how we can uh, pray for you. So you can click on, you know, scan that code, get to the links, and you can uh, click on uh, the prayer request, and you can let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, you can also have a link there where you can uh, click on it and give online. Uh, where you can support the ministry of the church, and we sure, sure appreciate everybody doing that. You've just blessed us so much, and we are thankful for the opportunity to continue in ministry uh, here in our community. If you brought an offering with you today as you're leaving here uh, after the service, there will be offering baskets. You can just drop them in the offering baskets as you're leaving here in just a little bit. If you have a, uh, There's another way you can give us a prayer request. There's this little slip of paper. It's in the back of the seat somewhere near you. And you can take those little, that little slip of paper uh, and fill it out, drop it in the offering baskets when you leave at the end of the service, and we'll be glad to pray for you as we meet together as a staff tomorrow. For today, we want to invite you to continue to pray for Chris and, uh, and uh, Tyler and Renee and Trey and the whole family. And Danielle, is, uh, the Stephanie service services yesterday, continue to pray for them and lift them up. We want to invite you to continue to pray for our nation and continue to pray for families that are, you know, that they would be, um, you know, the healing that needs to take place within families would happen and that people would, um, you know, seek the Lord and trust in Him and, and that families would be protected. So I invite you to pray for the families of this nation. Uh, 
Uh, if you'd like to join me for a time of prayer, you're welcome to slip out of your seat and come on down and join me. This altar is open for you. Let's pray together. My precious Father and our loving God, we are so thankful for today and the opportunity to be here in this place. We're thankful, Father, for your blessings that you give to us every day, even when we're not paying attention to them, even when we are ignoring them, you're still blessing us, Lord. I pray that we would look for you in all the little things that are all around us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would trust in you more. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with this church as we are looking for ways to continue to reach out in this community and share the gospel. I pray that we would be open to the moving of your spirit in whatever way. That we would share Jesus with people uh, in, in every way that we can. That we would not be hindered by anything, Father. We know Satan wants to stop us, but... We're not going to let him do that because we're going to trust in you to keep putting people in our path where we can share Jesus, to keep giving us those opportunities. So, Lord, help us as a church family to keep our eyes open to that. We thank you that we could celebrate a baptism today. What a joy that is. We thank you for Carl and uh, Brianna's desire to teach their children to know and love Jesus. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that that would be the desire of every parent and every grandparent to teach those precious little ones that you've given to us to know and love you more. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just talk, that you would continue to walk with us as we are teaching these children. Give us, Lord, give us the wisdom to know what to say and how to say it. Lord, I pray for our nation. We look all around us and we can see so many ways that we're running away from you and we're turning our backs on you, ignoring you. And I pray, Lord, that we would turn to you. I pray for a revival to sweep through this nation, Lord, and that revival begins in the hearts of every Christ follower. And I pray that we would truly be revived in our spirit we would be revived in our hearts we would be renewed with a commitment to you to grow closer to you and get to know you better and love you more I pray Heavenly Father that we would help tell others about you because you are the first and the greatest giver everything we have comes from you I pray Heavenly Father that we would always remember to stop and give thanks for those blessings. So we do that today. Thank you, Lord, for everything. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. This time we want to dismiss our youth to go find Sam for uh, their life groups. And we want to continue in the service. Walking the side, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw lightning from heaven. And I've never been the same I'm gonna climb a mountain I'm gonna shout about it I am a child of love I found a world of freedom I found a friend in Jesus I am a child of love Felt the sting of the fire, but I saw you in the flames. To 
just when I thought it was over, you broke me out of the grave. I'm going to climb a mountain. I'm going to shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. much for your love that we are all children of your love that because of you father because of your immense powerful constant love father that we can be just basking in that love that we are children of the king that father that we know the future we know the plans that you have for us are so great father thank you for allowing us to walk in that confidence that even when the days are dark Lord, we know that you have better days ahead of us. Father, we know that when things are great, Father, that you are rejoicing with us, and we are so grateful for a love that sees us through all the seasons of our lives. So, Father, we thank you so much today. We thank you so much for this time of worship. We thank you mostly for your love that never ends. And, Father, we thank you for the word that you've given to our pastor. And, Father, we just ask that each person that will hear it today, Father, will be moved, will be changed, will be inspired, and will be emboldened to go out into this world and share the good news of your son. So we love you. We give you all the glory in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, Ethan's been hiding that singing voice from us, hasn't he? Yeah, we're going to have to have a talk with that boy. So uh, um, we want to, uh, I want to just let you know about next week. Um, next week's Father's Day, and I'm going to be taking a pause in, our, in my series, and next week I'm going to be talking to the dads, and as I'm talking to the dads, we're going to be talking about how to avoid traps, uh, helping our children avoid traps, and so I hope uh, all the dads will be here, invite people to come and, and be here for that Sunday, um, uh, and uh, let's learn together how we can help our children avoid traps that they need to avoid. Um, so, just want to let you know, I'm going to pause for a minute. I guess I could say focus on the children next week. So, I guess it could be in the service, couldn't it? So, uh, we might do that. So, as we continue in the service, in, in our series that we're in today, uh, we're going to try to focus on hearing from God. I don't know how many of you out there like war movies. I, I like war movies. I grew up watching war movies. I grew up watching John Wayne and Audie Murphy and and Gary Cooper and Robert Mitchum and all these other guys and all these good old war movies that, that, that 
talked about and portrayed America's role in all the, the wars up to that point. And I know what you're out there thinking. Man, our preacher is old. You know, there's some people there I hadn't even heard of. I got to go Google all those folks. Uh, hey, they were before, some of them were before my time too. So just, I just want you to know that. Uh, but I, I would watch those. And, and uh, as I watch those, you know, today even, I, I like to watch uh, all, all these shows and movies and, uh, about, you know, the battles and, and, and how they uh, came about and what happened. And I don't know, it's just interesting to me. And uh, it kind of helps that I'm a history buff. I like, the, I like to see that kind of stuff. But I also enjoy watching those kind of things with my children who have served and are serving in the military. And the reason I like watching it with them is because it's amusing. Because I watch it with them and they're critiquing the actors who are portraying the military people in the movie or in the show. And now they're not critiquing them for their acting. They're critiquing all the mistakes in the movie about how the, or in the show about how the uniform is not right or about how the, their cover, their hat, their, you know, their cover is, is not right. You know, some of them now, uh, they have a, a beret in the, in the army and, and there's a special way it's supposed to go and it looks like the actor just took it and just shoved it down on his head. That's not how it's supposed to work. And, you know, their hair is too long or their medals and their ribbons are not right or... Or, you know, their, their, their uniform that they're wearing does not fit the period that they're supposed to be wearing. And so I watch that, and it's just, it amazes me to, that what they pick up on it. And now since they're watching it, I'm watching it. You know, the rank is wrong and all this kind of stuff. Well, when the directors or the producers, they don't do their homework and they get all this stuff wrong, we kind of give them a pass because it's just entertainment, right? I mean, you think they would hire a military guy to help them out or, or a lady to help them out, but you know, it's just entertainment. However, there are those who intentionally put on the uniform who have never served in the military and, who go, and these same people go around telling stories about battles that they never fought in and they wear medals and ribbons that they never earned. There's a, word, there's a phrase for that. That phrase is called stolen valor. And they may know the pro, some of the proper language to use, and they may know what some of the medals and some of the ribbons actually represent. They may know things about battles that they talk about. But these people who have never served, who are wearing the uniform and wearing all this stuff, they're, who have stolen this valor, they're imposters. And they talk the talk, but they haven't walked the walk. And I've watched many a, a, a video, many a, a story about how these imposters, you know, they can be easily picked out by those who have served and who have fought and who have earned those ribbons and medals. And once they're confronted, the more they try to convince those who know the truth about them, the more they show that they are imposters. You see, their stories and their facade, it begins to crumble because their fake military service is built on the shaky ground of lies and it cannot stand against the truth. See, unfortunately... Unfortunately, there are also imposters in the Christian faith. Matthew records a sermon that Jesus preached known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's a wonderful sermon. You can go back and read it. It's three chapters in Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the Sermon on the Mount is by far Jesus' longest explanation of what it looks like to live as his follower and to serve as a member of God's kingdom. And in many ways, if you look at that, looking at that sermon, in many ways, Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, it represents the major ideals of the Christian life. See, Jesus taught in that brief sermon, he taught about things such as prayer, 
how to care for the needy. He taught about fasting, about divorce, about judging other people, about salvation, and so much more. This Sermon on the Mount, it also contains what we know of as the Beatitudes. I once heard a preacher say, the Beatitudes are things we need to be at. <laughs> you know, those are things we need to be doing. It also contains the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, and, and it, where Jesus taught us all how to pray. You see, Jesus, he concludes that Sermon on the Mount with both a warning and instructions on how to build our lives and how we can focus on hearing from God. The warning comes first. And I want us to go back to uh, and look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 7 is at the end, this is at the end of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we pick up the sermon in Matthew 7, begin at verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only, those, only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Have you ever been around a person who is a self-professed athlete? I mean, they tell you uh, about how great they are and, and all that they can do. And they talk a great game, but their talk tells you nothing about their abilities and their skills. You know, I could tell you how good I can dunk. Hey, 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 hey. That hurts. I mean, that, that stings just a little bit, all right? I'm telling you, I can dunk. I can do it. You set the goal about right here, I'm your man. I mean, I, behind the back, boom, I am there. Dribble between the legs, go get the ball, and then come back and boom, double-handed it down. I can do that. I'm your man. Pick me for your team. I mean, you, you think about, you know, people, they, they talk all this stuff, and, you know, they talk about all, you know, these athletes, they, you know, they, they relive their glory days like we were there, you know, <laughs> and they, they, they talk a great game, but they can't pull it off. I mean, you get a guy that looks like me saying he can dunk with about a four-inch vertical leap, <laughs> that's with a running start. And, you know, it just, it's not going to happen. I mean, people, you know, they, they're imposters. They, they say that they can do something that they can't do. And listen, talk is cheap. Well, I can tell you I can dunk. We get that out there on the basketball court, it ain't going to take you long to figure out, I can't do it. And if I want to continue in this facade, I'll just not get on the court with you and I'll just tell you how good I am. See, talk is cheap. It means nothing if your actions don't back up your words. And what you say is not as important as what you do. Notice what Jesus said again back in Matthew 7, 21. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my heavenly Father who is in heaven. See, Jesus is more concerned with our talk than with, uh, with our walk than with our talk. He wants us to do right, not just to say the right words. You see, he also wants us to do right for the right reasons. See, the right reason for doing the things we do that he calls on us to do, the right reason is because we know Jesus as our Savior. That's the right reason. You see, you're not supposed to act like a saint on Sunday and live like the devil the rest of the week. I'm not supposed to get up here and talk to you about the love and mercy and grace of God on Sunday morning 
and then live like the devil the rest of the week. If I'm doing that, you need to fire me. Because I need to do what the Word says because I've invited Jesus into my heart. I need to live for Him. I need to be, a, you know, practice what He's telling me to practice. Not so y'all can look at me and say, oh, look, Pastor Jimmy's just a great guy. And, he, you know, he, he must love the Lord. I mean, just look at Him. Just look at Him. No. I need to live my life for Christ whether you're around or not. I need to live my life for Jesus whether you're looking at me or not. I need to live my life for Jesus whether I'm standing on the platform t- telling you about him or if I'm in my home by myself. Listen, just because you can quote scripture and pray eloquent prayers and sing like an angel and or you're generous with your giving, and you attend church every Sunday, and you join a life group, and you feed the hungry, and you build ramps, and you go on mission trips. Just because you do all of that stuff does not mean you are a Christ follower. Listen, people who are not Christ followers can do all those things that I just said. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of atheists that know their Bible, know the Bible better than a lot of Christ followers. Now, they're reading it for the wrong reasons. They're reading it to try to find what's wrong with it, not to teach them to, how to live their life, but they're, they're, they're doing that, and a lot of them can quote it better than a lot of Christ followers. Satan knows the Bible. He quoted the Bible back to Jesus. Out of context, but he did. See, when Jesus preached this sermon, you know who he was talking to? Now, there were some people who, who needed to know God in his group. But the, the big majority of folks listening to Jesus were religious people. Listen, they did all the religious things, but they did not have a relationship with God. I mean, they... they, they prayed and fasted and they read the Torah the, the, you know, and the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They, they read that. They read in the prophets that we have in our Old Testament. They, they read in that. And they followed a law. Uh, granted, it was a law that they took God's Ten Commandments and added over 600 other commandments to it. But, you know, they were following this law. They did all that stuff. But for too many of them, it was just something they did, and it had zero meaning for them. See, a lot of these folks did these things because they wanted other people to see how religious they are. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told these religious people they need to check themselves. And they need to check the reasons that they're doing what they do. Matter of fact, we're going to go back to Matthew 6. I'm going to give you several verses here in Matthew chapter 6 where the, Jesus warns the religious people about the motives for doing what they do. And just a few of these verses. And again, oh, I was going to tell you, if you would like a copy of the notes or a copy of all the All my sermon notes, you're welcome to them. Just let me know. I'll be glad to give you a copy. And uh, since you can't get to the notes today, again, I'll be glad to give them any sermon, not just today. I'll, I'll give you whatever I've used. But if we look at Matthew 6, let's look at what Jesus is telling these, these, these religious people. Matthew 6, 1. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. He said, don't do the stuff just so other people will see you. Then in Matthew 6, 2, it says, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Who do you think he was talking about when he was talking about the hypocrites in the synagogues? The religious people. 
here's my offering. You know, I mean, it's, it's like that, you know. They'd make a big deal out of it, and they'd come in, and, and they, you know, it wouldn't gently slide it in the box. It, you know, they would make sure people saw them giving this offering. It says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Oh, look, look how holy I am because I can pray just like this. And if I want to get real holy, I will change my voice. (laughs) And I shall use words that I use no other place. (laughs) Thou knowest that which of I speak. I mean, you know, they just wanted people to hear them. And, you know, listen, he says, when you pray... In verse 7 of chapter 6, it says, When you pray, <laughs> do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Then in verse 16, it says, When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show that they are fasting. Oh, I'm, I'd love to eat with you, but I'm fasting. It's for the Lord. I mean, they, they, they do it. They did all these things. These were the religious people. You think the non-religious people were doing any of this stuff? No. These were the people who were supposed to be telling others about God. They were making a mockery of the faith. Remember, it's the religious people who crucified Jesus. Now, I know the Romans nailed him to the cross, but they wouldn't have ever bothered Jesus. Because remember what Pilate said? You remember this? Remember what Pilate said whenever he had questioned Jesus and he had looked at him? He said these words, I find no fault in this man. So it wasn't the Romans... They, you know, they didn't, they didn't care about Jesus. They could care less. It was the religious people that had Jesus crucified. And once they crucified him, they went right back to doing all of their religious duties. And all of their religious rituals as if nothing had ever happened. And Jesus told these religious people that they were all talking about doing things in God's name. And they were hoping that that would help them get into heaven. But Jesus said that he never knew them. Why did he never know them? Because they did not have a relationship with him. I want to remind you again. There are people in colleges teaching Bible courses who don't believe the Bible. There are teachers in seminaries who are teaching pastors who are, they're not saved. They don't believe the truth of the Bible. I've had some of them. I've been in their classes. See, Jesus never said that there was anything wrong with praying or fasting or giving or, or trying to live a righteous life. Jesus was addressing the motives behind why these religious people were doing all of these things. And these religious people were doing all of these things so other people could see them, not because they loved God, not because they wanted to, to worship God, not because they wanted to have a, a, live a right life and, and live a good life and, and do what God wanted them to do, not because of any of that, so, but they did it so other people would see how righteous they are. You see, the problem is they had lost their focus. They had gotten too hung up on ritual. Doing this and this and this just because they've always done this and this and this.
Listen, if we're, gonna, if we're going to focus on hearing from God, then you need to hear this. We need to build our lives on a solid foundation. I don't know how many of you remember the former boxing world heavyweight Muhammad Ali. Oh, great. I'm dating myself again. All right. Google him. Look him up. He, he, you know, once was asked, and, and he changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. And the reason he changed his name is he became a Muslim. And in an interview, he was asked what faith meant to him. And concerning his, his Islamic beliefs, Ali replied this. He says, it means a ticket to heaven. One day we're all going to die, and God is going to judge us, our good and our bad deeds. If the bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. If the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. I'm thinking about the judgment day and how you treat people wherever you go. Help somebody through charity because when you do, it's being recorded. See, what Ali believed, he believed that whether or not he made it to his religion's version of heaven, it was totally dependent on what he did or he didn't do. And what Muhammad Ali was saying is he was building his faith based on works, on things he did. And whenever he was building his faith on himself and what he did, he was building on a weak foundation. And on October the 19th, 2010, a test was conducted at a place in South Carolina. It's the Institute for Business and Home Safety in Richburg, South Carolina. And what these researchers did is they, they built two 1,300-square-foot homes inside a $40 million laboratory. That's a big laboratory if you can hold two 1,300-square-foot homes. And so they built it in there, and the, and the first home was built based on conventional standards, you know, the regular standards that was, that, you know, could pass inspection and all of that kind of stuff. The second home, it was built on, with reinforcement straps. And these reinforcement straps, they were connected at every level of the building from the foundation all the way up to the roof. These researchers, they turned on these giant fans, and, and the reason they did that is so that it would create these gusts of wind that gusted up to 110 miles an hour, which is a Category 3 hurricane. And the first test they did is they, they did two experiments. The first one they did is they, it, it lasted 10 minutes. So they put these houses under 10 minutes worth of 110 mile an hour wind. And the conventional house, it, it began to shake a little bit, but it was okay. It survived these intense winds. The, the other one with all the straps securing it to the foundation, it was really basically not bothered. And so in both of these 10-minute, they, they, these first two experiments, these 10-minute experiments, both houses, they fared pretty well. But then they tried a third experiment. And in this third experiment... They turned the fans on for more than 10 minutes. And after the first 10 minutes, you know, what began to happen is the, the conventional home, it began to shake. It began to move and finally it collapsed. And the other home, the one that had the, the straps the, the, that was, went from the foundation all the way up to the roof, that home, it sustained the whole hurricane force winds with just some cosmetic damage. The difference, the only difference between the two homes was their foundation. One of the engineers working on the experiment, his name is Tim Reingold, he, he summarized the results with a very pointed question. He said, the bottom line you have to ask yourself is, which house would you rather be living in? I want 
you to notice what Jesus said about building on the right foundation as he concludes the Sermon on the Mount. These are the last verses of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, beginning at verse 24, it says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine... Now, I want to stop for just a second. Anytime you're reading the Bible and you see the word therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. Okay. The verses right before that, it was talking about uh, uh, imposters. We already gone through that. And then Jesus comes back and he says, therefore, I've just told you about all the imposters. Now he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Listen. If you want to build a new home, you can have the very best architect that money can buy to draw up your plans. You, you, you can then get the best construction materials available, sparing no expense. You can hire the most skilled craftsmen and the most skilled contractors to build the house. You can spare no expense. But listen, if you don't start with a solid foundation, that house will not stand when the storm comes. And what is true about that physical house is also what is true about your spiritual house. Listen, if you do not build your spiritual house on a foundation of a relationship with Jesus, then your spiritual house will collapse and it will have eternal consequences. Listen. Jesus did not say if the rains come or if the streams rise or if the winds blow. You need to hear this. Storms are going to come into your life. And they're not always like a hurricane that we can watch on TV for a week before it comes on land. Sometimes it's like a tornado that comes out of nowhere. Nobody saw it coming and it hits. So storms will come in your life. And the storms you go through in your life will reveal what kind of foundation that you have built your spiritual life on. The truth is, small pressures, sometimes we can sustain them on our own for a little bit. You know, it's just a little drizzle. A little April shower. Not that big a deal. Just sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. And we can handle that for a little while. And we can do that on our own for a little while. But eventually, we will begin to crumble. Because when we build on ourselves, we're building on a weak and shaky foundation. And without a firm foundation, you will not know where to turn when you are struggling. Whenever the major storm hits your life, if you do not have a firm foundation, you're not going to know where to go. You're going to be lost and without hope. You're not going to know what to do when you're hurting. You're going to struggle through life with no real sense of purpose. And you're going to live without hope. And you will never understand what it means to have true joy and true peace in your life. If you want to build on a firm foundation, friends, you need to focus on hearing from God. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about is how do you hear from God? We were talking in staff, and, and as we were talking in staff, I, I, I shared with them that we, we need a very clear definition of what it means to make disciples. We, Jesus called on us to make disciples. What does that mean? We need a very clear definition of that, and we have one, and 
I'm going to share it with you here in just a minute. But, uh, you know, what we're doing is we are in the process of restructuring our discipleship process here at Woodbine. And, and we have a, well, like I said, we have the definition of discipleship that we're using across all age groups. And then we're putting into place a process of fleshing out our definition in each one of those age groups. Because we don't, we, we don't believe we ought to wait until you graduate high school to make you into a disciple. We believe you need to start. At, I mean, we're having Bible lessons for toddlers. You ever try to teach a Bible lesson to a toddler? You ever tried to teach a Bible lesson to a two-year-old? It had better be a fast one. <laughs> Squirrel! You know, I mean, they're everywhere. But we're doing that. We're instilling in them the gospel. And we're starting as young as as we get them. And we're doing that throughout all the way up till you get to me. Ann's doing it. Diana's doing it. Sam's doing it. So, if you, listen, if you want to hear from God, then you need to put yourself in a position where you can hear from him. And what I mean by that is you need to be intentional about getting to know God better. And that is exactly what our discipleship process that we're putting together is going to help you do. Now, I don't want you to get lost in the word discipleship. I mean, how many of you have used that word in the past week? Oh, none of y'all. Okay. All right. All right. Good. I'm going to teach you what discipleship is. Discipleship is very simple. Here's a simple definition. Simply put, discipleship is the process of becoming more like Christ. Discipleship is getting to know Christ better and loving Him more. That's what discipleship is. It's not any more complicated than that. You might not use that word every day in your vocabulary. You might not be thinking about discipleship or or that word and what it means. But that's all it means. It's getting to know Christ better and loving more. And that's what we're teaching. Uh, and, and, and we're setting in a pro, uh, a put, putting together a plan and a process across all age levels to do that in a more directed way. So in order to help us Remember what discipleship looks like. I want to invite, I'm going to give you a memory tool. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. It's all yours. I'm just going to give it to you. And I'm going to give it to you this morning. And this memory tool is something that you carry around with you every day. I want to invite everybody. Just hold up your hand. All right. Good job. Good job. All right. Everybody did that. Appreciate it. Guess what? That's your memory tool. And we're going to walk through how you can use that hand as a mnemonic device to remind you of our definition of discipleship. I want you to start with your thumb. If you start with your thumb, it's your first finger. And what's so unique about the thumb is it sets us apart from every other animal on the planet, every other creation on the planet. That thumb sets us apart. And since it's our first Thing. It's our first digit. It sets us apart. We're going to do something that only we can do. And if you want to grow in your discipleship, you need to remember, you need to get in your Bible and you, you need to pray. You need to read your Bible and you pray. That's what the thumb means. It's the first thing you need to do. That's the first part of discipleship. And oh, Let me back up. A disciple is someone who knows Christ. If you don't know Jesus, I'll be glad to help you with that. But a disciple is someone who knows Christ and is growing in their faith first. The thumb. You need to get involved in Bible reading and in prayer. Make it a normal part of your life, intentional. All right. In the scriptures, it says this. Here's why you need to get into it. In 2 Timothy, it says, uh, Paul wrote to his young man, this young man, Timothy, his young guy. He says, all scripture is God-breathed. In other words, God gave us all this. He gave it all to us. All scripture is God-breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Word is to be used to help us get to be more like Christ, to to follow Him closer. And also, when it comes to prayer, there's a lot of verses about prayer. But notice what Paul wrote in Romans. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. What's that last part? Faithful in prayer. Your thumb, first finger, sets us apart from everybody else. That means we can read the Bible and pray. The second one is your pointer finger, your index finger. And let me tell you why this is important. 
It points us, whenever we, we're trying to show somebody something, it points us to something that is important. And our pointer finger is to remind us to point to things that are important, and it represents regular worship attendance. Regular worship attendance, what it does, it points us to God, and it gives us tools to help us in our faith. Listen, the only time you hear, hear, read or hear from the Bible, and the only time you pray should not be on Sunday morning. I can't feed you enough on Sunday morning to last, for you to last spiritually all week long. you got to feed yourself. So our pointer finger, it means that it points to something important. And something important is regular worship attendance. And the reason it's important is not so we can have a nice, long, big number so, to, so we can make a report to send into some organization or something like that. The reason it's important is because regular worship attendance helps you grow in your faith and it helps point you to the most important one, and that's Jesus. Look at what the Scripture says. In Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So you got to get in the Word. It says, Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom... That's what we do in here. We teach each other. Yeah, I learn from you. You learn from me. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Hey, we just did that, didn't we? With thankfulness in our hearts to God. Worship. I like Chrissy's little hashtag. Worship all the time. So our pointer finger points to something important, and that's worship. Then we have our third finger. The third finger is a center finger. It reminds us that we need help to keep ourselves centered. And the reason we need that help is that, and the best way to get that help is we can join a life group. But if you're not part of a life group, you're missing out. And the reason you're in a life group and connected with a life group is we get help in our life groups to help us stay centered in our faith. I don't know about you, but I need Wednesday. That's when my life group meets. I need Wednesday. You know why? Because it's halfway through the week, and I need a little boost to help me out. I need that. It helps keep me centered. I know I'm going to be there on Wednesday night, and I'd be in my life group whether I'm a pastor or not. I would be in my life life group because I need help getting centered. That center finger reminds me that I need to stay centered See, we surround, whenever we're in our life groups, we surround ourselves with people we can depend on. And we surround ourselves with people with whom we can grow and we can offer and receive encouragement. It's important. Look at what Proverbs said. Two verses. One in Proverbs, one in Luke. And Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We learn from each other. In Luke 2, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. If, if Jesus needed to grow in wisdom and in stature, don't you think we need to? Our center finger, it keeps us centered. Then we have our ring finger. Our ring finger, it stands for serving. And the reason it stands for serving is because serving has a ring, nice ring to it. It really does. Hey, I'm doing the best I can with that one, okay? (laughs) It has a nice... Listen, we are not saved just to take care of ourselves. We're saved to serve. Not so anybody else will see it. Listen, there are things that go on behind the scenes at this church that most of you never know about, and it's done by a lot of lay people. Not done by a lot of staff. It's done by a lot of regular church folks just like you. And so part of discipleship is serving and finding a way to serve. Notice what the Scripture says about that. Jesus said this. He said this about himself in Matthew. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Serving has a nice ring to it. The last one is your pinky finger. Whenever you go and meet somebody for the first time, what you do, you open up your hand and reach out and shake their hand. That last finger, it represents helping you helping introduce other people to Jesus and introduce Jesus to other people. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Every disciple's responsibility is to introduce other people to Jesus. 
Acts 1.8, Jesus said this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the utter ends of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses, he said. That's what it means. See, we believe that these five areas are needed to make a well-rounded disciple and follower of Jesus. We believe that Christ's followers need to grow in each one of these areas. And by growing in each of these areas, the Christ follower is is going to become closer to Christ and get to know Him better and love Him more. The thumb, the first finger, reading and Bible study. The pointer finger is pointing to what is most important, and that's our worship of God and pointing to Him. The the center finger reminds me to keep myself centered, and I do that by joining a life group. The ring finger, because serving has a nice ring to it, and I need to be serving. And the pinky finger reminds me of the handshake because I am to introduce other people to God. I know that there are those who are here that are not yet Christ followers who are just checking God out. And I'm glad you're checking Him out. But I want to invite you to go deeper. God wants you to build your life on a firm foundation. And any life that is not built on Jesus is on shaky ground. And you're not going to be able to withstand the storm that's coming. A life built on Jesus... You can find rest in the worst storm that life throws at you because Jesus is our firm foundation. So I want to invite all of us right now, wherever you are, I want to invite us to be very honest with ourselves. When we have to face the storms that will hit our lives, will we stand or will we crumble? What kind of a foundation are we building our lives on? Is it unstable like sand? Or is it firm like a rock? Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, here we are. We're in this place. And we're seeking to hear from you. And Father, I pray that you would help us to truly, truly hear from you today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to seek you with our whole hearts and seek to know you better and love you more. Maybe there's some here within the sound of my voice that they've been just playing around with this thing called Christianity. They've been playing around with this idea of accepting Jesus, but today they're tired of playing. They're ready to give their life over to you. If that's who you are, if you want to give your life to Jesus, He's waiting on you. You can give your life to Jesus today with just by praying this very simple prayer. And you can remember this very simple prayer with these four simple words. First word is sorry. Just pray this just between you and God right where you are. God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry I've rejected you up to this point in my life. I'm sorry. The next word is please. Please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life and save me. Please become the Lord of my life. Please help me because I need you. The last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for being there for me. Thank you for always loving me, Lord. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins and saving me today. Father, for those who prayed that prayer for the first time today in a minute, I pray that you would work in their life and help them as they become your disciples. Help them to grow to love you, know you better and to love you more. I pray, God, that you would help us to come along beside them and help them in their walk of of faith. And I pray for the rest of us. We may have already been Christ followers for a long time, but Lord... Sometimes we slip back and we go into ways that we know know you don't want us to go. And we do things that we know we should not do. But I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us right now. Forgive us for that. And help us to be stronger by leaning on you and stop leaning on ourselves. Help us to continue to build our life on that solid foundation of Jesus.
and not on the weak foundation of each one of us. We need you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. As we do each week, this altar is open for a time of prayer. If you'd like to spend some time down here, you're welcome to do that. There are places all around these altars. If you want me to pray with you, I'll be glad to do it. Simply get my attention. If you don't get my attention, I won't bother you. But if you'd like for me to, I'll be glad to pray with you. So as you're able, will you please stand? As we sing this next song, this altar is open for you. I need words Deeper than the ocean And I need a voice It's bigger than the sky And I need a song That's worthy of your nail scars To sing of the love That took a chance on me Now this is more than I could ask for And more than I could dream The one who made the world Somehow thinks the world of me And highest king of heaven Chose to love But I know I want nothing more than you. And I thought, God, was further than horizon. And I thought, was just beyond my reach But you said my life was worthy of your nail scars So I sing like it was Cause you took a chance on me And now this is more than I could ask for And more than I could dream The one who made the world Somehow thinks the world of me The highest king of heaven And chose to love a fool I know I want nothing more I want nothing more than you When I was at my lowest You were still on your throne When I was still a long way on, you ran to bring me home. When I was prone to wonder, you loved me in When I Six feet under You pulled me from your 
now this is more than I could ask for and more than I could dream. The one who made the world somehow thinks the world the highest king of heaven who chose to love a fool. And I don't understand, but I know I Want nothing more oh. That's a perfect song for right now. The one who made the world chose to love me and chose to love you. Even when we're acting like a fool, he still chose to love us. I love that. Nothing keeps his, keeps his love away from us. And I want you to remember that. I want you to grow in your relationship with him. If you don't know him, talk to one of us. Talk to me, talk to Brenda, talk to one, on the st- one of us on the staff. We'll be glad to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus. If you do know him and you need help in your journey, talk to us. If you made a decision for Jesus, email me. Talk to me today. Email me if you don't want to talk to me today. Email me at imn at woodbinechurch.org. imn at woodbinechurch.org. Let us help you with your next steps. If you're a first-timer here, you've been here before, I'd love to visit with you. I'll be over in the family room, exit these doors, and left, you'll see me over there. Drop in and see me. Let's visit for a few minutes. We'll get to know each other a little better. This time, I want to invite Miss Brenda to come up. She's going to close us out with prayer. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Ms. Brenda. Thank you, Pastor. I want to let you know it is summertime, so we have a unique schedule going on. Tomorrow night, all the ladies are invited movie night, 6 o'clock, back at 5.05, so you'll want to be a part of that. Check us out online, we'll let you know what classes are meeting. Let us pray. Oh God, you are awesome. We love you, and we thank you for the privilege that we get to come inside this room and worship with other believers. Thank you for the folks that day in and day out keep coming in here, even though life's hard. Bless them, anoint them, let them see your spirit in a special way. I'm gonna climb a mountain, I'm gonna shout about it, I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom, I found a friend in Jesus, I am a child of love.